Tonight is our question and answer night, and we're going to attempt to answer about four questions tonight. Uh, the first of which is, uh, if God initially told man to not eat meat, uh, why did Abel have flock? So what we're going to do to explore this question is we're going to explore the, uh, di- we could say, dietary laws of uh, Genesis 1 and Genesis 9, and then go from there. So if you will, turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. And we'll briefly look at what God expected humanity to eat initially. We'll talk about why things changed and and what we can learn from that. And in the process, we'll be able to answer the question. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 1. And let's briefly look at verses 28 uh, through 31. Keep in mind, this is right after the creation of mankind. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with its seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. To every beast of the earth, to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, Everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. There was evening and there was morning the sixth day. So what we note is that uh, in the, the first creation account that we have in Genesis 1 is God spins, uh, what Moses reveals to us is that God initially makes several Domains such as the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and then he fills them with their respected uh, inhabitants. And on the final day, he makes humanity, and he gives creation into man's hands to uh, look after it, to subdue it. And we even see that he has uh, given uh, the animal kingdom into humanity's hands. But in reference to food, this is what he says in verse 29. Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. Uh, So I think it's very easy to go to this passage and say, okay, so it appears that initially humanity was essentially supposed to be vegetarian. Sorry, Gary. But that seems to be the case. Although you could argue that since God gave animals into the domain of humanity, this would include um, eating them as well. But I think Genesis chapter 9, and if you will turn with me there, clarifies that this is not the case. Keep in mind, this is in the context of uh, the post-flood world, where uh, God has spared Noah and his family, and he is about to enter into a new covenant with them. Notice what he says to Noah and his family in verses 2 and 3. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens and upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. We'll stop right there. So let us first ask the question, why did God give two different dietary instructions to humanity at two different times. Uh, Well, one of the things we uh, need to observe when we are studying the scriptures is that God has an ideal will. He has something which he ideally sets out to do, although uh, sometimes humanity gets in the way of that plan. Now, one of the things that I think is helpful for understanding what God ideally wants, especially for humanity, is considering Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and uh, Revelation chapter 21. What we see when we read Genesis chapters 1 and 2 is what God began with. And as we noted, it was very good. And then when we look at passages like Revelation chapter 21 or any other prophetic passages that talk about the end, uh, we see what God is working toward to accomplish. And just make a mental note of that. And what we find from the very beginning, especially when we look at passages like Genesis chapter 2, verse 19, and even what we read in Genesis 1, is that humanity initially had a very harmonious relationship with the animal kingdom. That was according to God's ideal will. And as we see when we read Genesis chapter 2, verse 19, there, doesn't appear to, there does not appear to be any fear or hostility. All the animals are brought to Adam, and he names each one. 
indicating that he is exercising his authority and dominion over them. But again, no fear or terror. And when we look at uh, prophecies concerning uh, the future, we find that the prophets sometimes use this harmonious imagery to talk about God's ideal and what he is seeking to accomplish. If you want to, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11, we'll briefly look at verses 6 through 9. Uh, we also find this imagery in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 25, but we're going to be focusing on Isaiah chapter 11. And in the context, uh, this is Isaiah talking about, uh, using a very similar imagery to talk about the results of the, the Messiah's work, or the result of the, the finished uh, uh, result of the Messiah's work. Starting at verse 6. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion, and the fatted calf together, and a little child shall, le shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. So we see Isaiah uses similar Im imagery, you might say he magnifies it, when he's talking about what God ideally wants. However, we see in Genesis chapter 9, it appears that God allows humanity to do something that wasn't what he initially intended. So let's explore this briefly. What we note when we read through Genesis chapter 3 through 11 is that God has this plan for humanity and creation. And as things go on, we get in the way. Uh, we sin, we mess things up. We find several examples of this. In reference to Adam and Eve, uh, we find that they uh, faced many consequences for their sin, of course, with, with Cain, and of course the sins of Genesis 6 as well. And whenever anything like this happens in this area of Scripture, there's always a consequence. Uh, for uh, Adam and Eve, we see that the ground was cursed. Uh, I think uh, Paul uses the, the language that creation was subject to futility. We find with Cain that his labor was cursed. He was not able to grow from the ground. And, of course, we find eventually, uh, due to the bloodshed that we find in Genesis 6, the entire earth was destroyed with a flood. But in every instance where God executes judgment, he often gives a consolation, or he often demonstrates an act of mercy afterward to help humanity. In reference to Adam and Eve, we see that he gave them clothes, and as well, he allowed them to enjoy many of the blessings they had before, although under toil. In reference to Cain, even though uh, he cursed his labor, he still gave him a mark of protection. And now when we get to Genesis 9, after God is essentially starting over with humanity through the family of Noah, he gives them this act of consolation. He now allows animals to be a part of their diet. Now, why would God do something like this? Well, there are a few potential interpretations. Uh, one, it could be that much of the bloodshed was, that was uh, uh, caused under the pre-flood world was due to a, a war over resources, maybe over food and things like that. And so in order to prevent something like that, perhaps God is allowing humanity to have access to the animal kingdom. Or it could be that God realizes that due to the after effects of the flood, uh, relying only on vegetation may not be as much of a reliable source. Regardless of which interpretation you picked, it appears that God was concerned for the survival of humanity, and as we see, he allowed them to use animals, either through uh, livestock or through hunting, to survive. But what about Abel? Uh, as we see in Genesis chapter 4, verse 2, uh, Abel was keeping flocks uh, long before this consolation was ever given. We also note in Genesis chapter 4, verse 20, that uh, Jabal, the son of Lamech, uh, he appears to have mastered uh, animal, husbands, uh, hu wow, animal husbandry uh, on a more sophisticated level, especially in, in uh, incorporating uh, a more nomadic living arrangement. Uh, so why would they keep flocks even though uh, God did not permit them to eat animals at that time. Well, 
we have to remember that when it comes to flocks, especially concerning herds like goats or sheep, even in the post-flood world, uh, most of the time you didn't eat those animals. Uh, they were for their, their, you used them for their wool, their hair, and of course their milk. Uh, most farmers or shepherds uh, did not want to slay them or get rid of them. Uh, although, you know, in the future after the flood, you might slaughter some of the males during uh, uh, their birthing season, but for the most part, you didn't. Uh, but what we find in Genesis 4, uh, I think, in many ways, uh, depicts the ideal picture that God wanted for animals and humanity. As we see, Abel would take these animals under his care. Uh, he would enjoy the products that are made by them. In exchange, he would look after them and see to their needs. Uh, and he would have gotten a lot out of them, even without eating them. And of course, as we also note in Genesis 4, because of, of sin entering into the world, sacrifice would now play an important part in their relationship with God. But in short, uh, Abel's actions are completely consistent with the instructions we find in Genesis 1. Uh, and it does not violate anything that God intended. Now, before we uh, move to the next question, I want to uh, just uh, observe one more thing. Uh, I know when I'm often on Facebook, I see various memes and jokes, and I see a lot of vegan humor and people making fun of vegetarians. Now, I don't mind making fun of anyone in, in good taste. I make fun of myself. I don't mind laughing at anyone else either. But I do see some harsh humor against vegetarians and vegans. I saw someone on Facebook say that they make sure to eat extra animals to offset what the vegetarians are doing so no animals are saved. Um, which, you know, is, is funny in a sick kind of way. But one of the things that bothers me about this is it's actually Christians making these kinds of jokes. And when we look at the scriptures, when we look at Genesis 1 and 2, when we look at uh, the depictions given by Isaiah, it, actually God uses a vegetarian diet to depict this idea of harmony in his ideal will. And... Um, even though I think it's okay to make fun of some, some other people, if it's in good taste and in respect, uh, I would be careful in this area because this is what the scriptures use to talk about God's ideal relationship with humanity. And we have to acknowledge that, um, that this is a liberty, a consolation he has given to us. And of course, we can't bind a vegetarian diet on anyone, and we shouldn't. We still need to understand how this is used to paint a very important picture in the scriptures. So let's move on to the next question. Uh, what qualifies as an idol? I think this is a very important question because uh, for most of us, you know, we, have, we don't really have any contact with, with idols for the most part. Uh, but idols are, are all over the scripture. They are constantly referenced in the scripture. And so it can be difficult for us to understand what is going on when the prophets and the apostles reference such things. And so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, briefly uh, talk about how pagans understood idols. Then we're going to talk about uh, how the, the Hebrews, at least the righteous Hebrews, understand idols and what God had to say about that. Uh, and then we'll see if there's any practical application today. Now, when, uh, when we look at ancient Judaism and ancient paganism, we do sometimes see uh, similarities in worship. Not always, but some similarities and, and maybe temple design or how certain things were sacrificed, at least to, to some degree. But one of the biggest differences we find in uh, ancient Judaism and ancient paganism, uh, besides the ethical issues, one of the biggest differences we find is the use of idols and how the Jews did not. Now for us, idols seem like such a foreign concept, but for the ancient Hebrews, when they rejected idols, this made them stick out like a sore thumb. Uh, all the way into the Roman period, when the Romans began to interact with Jews, they could not fathom them having a religion without an idol. In fact, some Romans thought they were just lying and actually had their idol hidden away. They could not fathom a religion without idolatry. So let's briefly talk about what an idol was from a pagan perspective, especially more from an Old Testament perspective. Uh, when we think of an idol or someone making an idol, we think a person is just wanting to make up uh, a brand new god on the spot. But this is not normally uh, what an idol was. There might be a community or a city-state, and they might have a particular god they worship. 
and they would say, okay, now we want this God to come live with us. So what we're going to do is we're going to build him a house, which would be a temple, and then we're going to build an idol. They would take some wood and shape it into a particular shape, uh, either that of a person or that of an animal. And it wasn't that they thought their God was an animal. They used this animal and its attributes to, to symbolize their God and its strength. Uh, often what we find uh, used is that of a, a calf or a bull. Now, after they shaped this wood, they would overlay it with silver or gold. And uh, then they would perform various rituals because they would attempt, at least from their perspective, their mindset, uh, they thought that they could quite literally invite their god or a part of their god to come and live in the idol. There would be one ceremony to uh, have their god ensoul the idol. Keep in mind, this is their perspective. And they would have various rituals to enable the idol to eat the food that they offered it. Now, once the temple and the image was completed, they would put the image in the temple, perform all the rituals, and then from there on, they would take care of the idol like it was a person. Uh, every night, they would put it to bed, and every morning, they would get up, bathe it, clothe it, uh, feed it, lay food before it, uh, and then put it to bed, and then the next day, they would start all over again. Uh, and... Uh, now, of course, they did feel that this idol was a god in, in a sense, but they also felt that their god primarily resided in heaven, just a part of it lived within the idol. Now, what we find throughout these scriptures is that the scriptures completely reject this idea or this notion or this practice altogether. Let's briefly read Isaiah chapter 44. If you'll turn with me there. Isaiah chapter 44, and we'll just read verses uh, 12 through 17. And if you wanted a parallel passage, you might be able to read uh, Jeremiah 10 as well. But we'll briefly look at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 12, verse 17. There are many other passages like this that address this issue, but we'll just, we'll just start here. Starting in verse 12. The ironsmith takes a cutting tool and works it over the coals. He fashions it with hammers and works it with his strong arm. He becomes hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. The carpenter stretches a line. He marks it out with a pencil. He shapes it with planes and marks it with a compass. He shapes it into a figure of a man with the beauty of a man to dwell in a house. He cuts down cedars where he chooses a cypress tree or an oak and lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar, and the rain nourishes it. Then it becomes fuel for a man. He takes a part of it and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. And he makes a god and, and worships it. And he makes it an idol and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over, uh, over the, the half he eats meat. He roasts it and is satisfied. And he warms himself and says, Aha! I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his idol. And he falls down and worships it. He prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. Now, what Isaiah is addressing, and we find this kind of a response in other places, is the idea that from Israel's perspective, if you have to make a body for God, especially of the same materials that you would cook with, uh, or build with, is that a God really worth serving? And I have to check, I think it may be in uh, Jeremiah chapter 10, there is the idea that, you know, if you have this idol and you have to prop it up so it doesn't fall over, is that actually a good representation of, of any God worth serving? Uh, Paul goes uh, a little bit further on this in Acts chapter 17, verses 24 through 29. He, he even makes the case that, can that which is divine really be represented by these material things like gold, silver, and wood? Now, of course, you could make the case that God could have implemented an idol in his worship. Certainly, he had no problem placing his glory uh, within the tabernacle. Hypothetically, he could do it within an idol. But he knew that if he did that with Israel, it would teach so many of the wrong lessons. Uh, it would teach them that they could represent him with their own hands, that they could craft a body for him. And of course, their understanding of idols, they would think, oh, well, we need to take care of our God. 
Uh, not only that, it would be this idol receiving the worship and not him uh, directly. And so we see when we consider how the pagans apply this idea of idolatry, we can understand why God from the very beginning, all the way back to the Ten Commandments, completely rejects the use of idols. You can even obviously make the case before that, but Gen Exodus 20 is the first time we get a full rejection of the use of, of idols. Now, again, idols are so far removed from our life that it's hard to find a parallel. Although there are some forms of, of Christianity that attempt to incorporate images into their worship. Uh, many might have a particular image of a, of a saint or uh, of Jesus or of Mary, and they might bow before it or kiss it or pray in its presence. Now, of course, you know, those who have such things would not believe that uh, Jesus actually dwells within the idol or the saint actually dwells within the idol. So there is a the difference there. But often the kind of reverence that they give this image and the kind of uh, and the particular activities they do with and toward this image overla overlaps with this idea of idolatry in so many ways. Uh, some might say, well, these images that we have, for example, of, of Jesus uh, is okay because when we look at the temple or the tabernacle, God allowed the, the creation of the cherubim. But when we look at the, the cherubim, which do represent a, a heavenly reality, they were never used for worship or veneration. Others might say that when they are kissing an image or an icon, or when they're bowing before it, they are simply using this to model themselves bowing before the person they are serving or honoring in heaven. But again, this is how pagans understood and facilitated their worship as well. Uh, some would say that Im images, especially of Jesus, are appropriate now because when God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, uh, he hadn't revealed himself visually, so there was no image to be made of him. But again, this isn't really the case. Uh, as we noted, there were many theophanies where God revealed himself in some way to Moses, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when we look at passages like Exodus chapter 24, verse 11, we even see that the elders of Israel saw God at least to some degree on the mountain. Uh, not to mention the angel of Yahweh, or the angel that is Yahweh, often revealed himself to the people of Israel. So there were plenty of images that they could have made, um, and yet God always forbade the use of an idol. Now, admittedly, of course, there are differences between the icons that we see today and the images that we see today, but with the reverence and the respect and the attitude with which they are treated overlaps so much with what we see in ancient idolatry that, it, that it's, it's hard to say that God would approve of that, to say the least. So let's look at the next question. Uh, is Dungeons and Dragons satanic? Now, for I think many of us who play Dungeons and Dragons on a regular basis might find that a weird question, although we're gonna explore this a little bit further because uh, believe it or not, in the 80s, uh, Dungeons and Dragons was frequently associated with uh, Satanism, and we'll explore why that is. In the 60s and, well, actually we probably should explore who here doesn't know what Dungeons and Dragons is? Okay, so, oh, you guys have all read the uh, player manual you, and the dungeon master manual? Okay, no one raised their hand, so well, just in case, I'll explain it anyway. Okay, okay. I was surprised about how many people were so familiar with the rules. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons is a co cooperative storytelling game set in a fantasy environment for as few as two to as many as eight or nine players. Uh, there is one person who plays the dungeon master where they create an environment with challenges and obstacles and then everyone else makes a character that uh, interacts with these challenges and obstacles and as the game progresses you are uh, co collectively telling a story together. Now in the 60s and 70s our culture experienced uh, a lot of change, a lot of new ideas and lifestyles. Uh, there was the rise of New Ageism. New Ageism had existed before that, but it really got going, especially in the 60s and 70s. And there was the rise of Spiritism, uh, or the re-rise of it. it. It came back. 
uh, Satanism, especially with the, uh, the, the Church of Satan by Anton LaVey. There was the rise of Eastern philosophy and, of course, uh, the rise of drug culture and the sexual revolution. And at that time, uh, many parents were concerned about everything that was going on in the world. Uh, they were really concerned about the kind of world they were raising their kids in, as many of us are today, although for very different reasons. But the fear of Satanism was especially concerning to uh, many. Uh, and we'll talk about what is called the satanic panic briefly. Um, and we'll talk about uh, what caused it or what contributed to it. Uh, one man was uh, by the name of Mike Warnke uh, was someone who was a comedian, pretty popular comedian, and I, I think he was a part of some evangelical group. And at his shows, he would often give his testimony, his story about how he became a Christian. And this is at a time when uh, some people felt that they really had to make their testimony sound really cool to seem more saved, I don't know. But um, he, would, he would say that before he became a Christian, he was a part of a satanic cult. And as you can imagine, that was really gripping, got a lot of attention. But as time went on, his stories became more and more extreme. Uh, it got to the point where he was saying that there were secret satanic cells all over the United States. And now I'm not saying there were not satanic groups or anything like that, but he said it was essentially just everywhere. Uh, and he claimed uh, that there was a, l a lot of human sacrifice. And in fact, he was treated so much as an expert that they had him on 60 Minutes. And you can even find uh, his uh, uh, comments on that episode on YouTube today. There was also a man by the name of John Todd. He was a speaker who, uh, and he may have been one of the ones popularizing the idea that if you play certain rock songs backwards, there's a secret satanic message. I never checked that myself. I'm pretty skeptical. But anyway, he said that. And um, he told a lot of people that there was a secret cabal of, sa cabal of Satanists uh, controlling the world, the media, and the music industry. Um, I don't think they need Satanist help for that. But anyway, that's what he argued. Now, both of these men claim that Dungeons and Dragons was sort of this, this gateway drug into Satanism specifically. So there is that side of it. But there were two cases in particular. There, there may have been more, but these two uh, cases uh, helped make Dungeons and Dragons known by the... Let me rephrase it this way. There, there were two cases in particular that helped uh, more people know about Dungeons and Dragons, especially in a more negative light. There was the death of James Egbert. He was a young man, and he and his friends played Dungeons and Dragons regularly. Uh, the weird part was they would play it in the steam maintenance tunnels at his school. Probably not the most convenient place to play a board game, but, you know, that's what young men and their teenagers like to do, so... Um, However, uh, he was a man who struggled a lot with mental health, and he would sometimes run away, and unfortunately he would make uh, several suicide attempts, and eventually uh, he succeeded. Now, when the media caught wind of this, uh, and the fact that he was meeting in a secret tunnel, they said that uh, he was a part of a bizarre and secretive cult, which players could only join by invitation. Uh, and uh, eventually, uh, eventually, the private investigator who actually looked at the case uh, wrote in his book that he was just a man who struggled with depression and uh, issues with his family. He just happened to play Dungeons and Dragons. But because of the satanic panic and the fact that he played it, his death got caught up uh, in everything else. And then there was the, uh, the case of another young man by the name of Irving Pulling. He uh, was a man who also had a lot of mental issues, and he eventually committed, committed suicide. And his family uh, sued Dungeons and Dragons and said that their game was the fault of his suicide because uh, he got a curse in the game and it somehow equated him in him committing suicide. Uh, and this also caused a lot of bad press for Dungeons and Dragons. Now, there may have been other cases, but these are the cases that uh, you typically find online. These are the cases that are typically attributed with uh, 
getting general audiences to hear about Dungeons and Dragons, especially in a negative light. Now, as time went on, men like Warnke and Todd uh, were shown to be frauds when people actually looked into their claims about their life and who they were and what they said, much of what they claimed could not be substantiated or was shown to be an outright lie. And eventually, uh, as time went on, people began to see the death of, of James Egbert and uh, uh, Irving Pulling as uh, young men who simply struggled with mental illness and did not get the help that they needed. But for a while, uh, this helped cause Dungeons and Dragons to get a lot of negative press. And uh, even today, you can still find uh, videos on YouTube talking about how it is used to induct people into Satanism. But if you actually just read the books, like the instruction manuals, um, it's a cooperative, uh, it's, it's a game that involves cooperative storytelling. And even the manuals themselves will say uh, that these rules are more of a guideline. You know, you, you take these rules and then you make up the story you want to tell. And I suppose if you wanted to, you could make it as satanic as you wanted to. But most people, the vast majority of people, do not do such a thing. Uh, most people simply want to tell a story with their friends and they use the rules in the set to do so. So in short, is Dungeons and Dragons satanic? No, hypothetically you could make it satanic, but you could make anything satanic. And the last question tonight is, should Christians watch anime? Now again, this might be a, a shocking question to some of us, because I think most of us as young people watch anime on a regular basis. Although I can understand why someone would ask this question. Uh, if you, you click the wrong, uh, episode on Netflix. Uh, there are some anime that is extremely inappropriate and uh, no Christian should watch anything like that. But anime is such a general term. Uh, it simply refers to Japanese animation, uh, much like the animation in the United States. So you can have anything as innocent and as wholesome as Looney Tunes and anything as, as vile and inappropriate as Family Guy. There's a large spectrum. And it's the same way with, with anime. Uh, you can find things that are extremely uh, child-friendly and appropriate, all the way up to some more X-rated content. But regardless of, of what kind of media or what kind of entertainment we enjoy, we should just make sure that it is consistent with our Christian values and ethic. Let's briefly consider what Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And as we are, you know, uh, looking at Hulu or Netflix or, or, or Crunchyroll or wherever you, you know, enjoy your uh, streaming services, we should just ask ourselves when we are trying to find something that is entertaining, is it noble, is it true, is it worthy to, to dwell on and to think about, and if it's not, well, then it's not for us. Uh, but again, the term anime is just so broad that it covers so many things. Uh, it's just like any other genre or show. There, there are some shows that are good, some shows that are bad, and we should just apply our Christian ethic to decide uh, what is good for ourselves. Now this concludes our questions for tonight. If you have any questions at all, as you can see, we don't mind answering a wide range of questions. So if any questions at all, please put your question in the question and answer box. Or if you have a more private question, please feel free to let us know and we'll also uh, help you find a Bible answer. But before we conclude tonight, if you are here and uh, you are not a Christian and you have questions about the faith or the existence of God or anything at all, well, we'd be glad to sit down and through logic and reason, help you find uh, the answer that you're seeking. Uh, but if you're here tonight and you are not a Christian, and you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you're willing to repent of your sins and put Christ on in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins, we'd be glad to assist you now. If there's anything we can do for you spiritually, please come forward as we stand and sing.